Hello and welcome to my talk. My name is Patricia Alves Oliveira and I am here to present the work Children as Robot Designers, performed in collaboration with my advisors Patricia Riaga, Anna Paiva and Guy Hoffman. This is how social robots have been traditionally developed for children. They are developed by adults who have a different mindset of a child. There is a pressure for robot designers to include end users, such as children, in the design process. What usually happens is that children are included only in later stages when the design choices have been implemented and there is little space for change. Including the voices of children in the design of a social robot is important because any robot that accounts for children's needs and values will be easily accepted, adopted, and honor their developmental stage. But let's look deeper into why children have not been traditionally included in the design of robots. One of the reasons is due to sample representation, as it is not always easy to find children as participants for studies. When we indeed have access to children, we quickly realize that traditional methods of data collection, such as questionnaires, interviews, thinking aloud, don't really work with children. And when we can finally get some data from children, we can be faced with a mapping problem where the children's data is not easily translated in robot requirements. In other words, it is not simple to understand what to change in the robot given the feedback we got from children. In this work, we want to precisely understand how we can involve children in the design process of a social robot from the very beginning. We are especially interested in what methods and which tools are necessary to design a successful robot for children. And we did it. It was a long design process of two years involving 142 children. Our design space concerned the development of a social robot to be used as a toy and whose goal was to develop creativity in children during playtimes. Our final robot is called YOLO and it looks like this. It has about 12 centimeters height, it's light weighted, it has three omni wheels and a light on the top of his head. It is not humanoid and this was a robot that emerged from this design process. To design this robot, we followed the double diamond process model, which consists of four main stages, discover, define, develop and deliver, and is shaped in the form of two diamonds where the design process fluctuates between moments of divergent and convergent thinking. We will come back to this model later. Another important aspect was the role that children can have during the design process. The role of children in the design of robots is well reported in the literature and can go from being the users to co-researchers to protagonists. In our work, children were included with different roles depending on the design stage. We followed four design principles with children. The first design principle is a robot with low floor and wide walls, which means the robot's behaviors are easy and simple to understand for children without requiring learning a new skill set. The second design principle is creativity provocations, and we use two techniques for stimulating divergent and convergent thinking, two creativity styles that the robot can promote. The third design principle is open-ended play, and the robot was used in this context to stimulate fantasy, imagination, and make-believe situations. The fourth design principle is an abstract form, and our robot is non-humanoid, so let's go back to the diamond model and look closer of how we design YOLO following this model. The first stage, which is discover, we collected information that led to an understanding about the robot's context of use, application scenario, and how it could meet the user's needs. To achieve this, we performed a literature review on creativity and children. We conducted interviews with creativity experts, and we also observed how children just play. I will detail on the observation of play. Without disrupting their play routine, we observed and took notes and recorded the play patterns of children. While we observed children playing, we noticed they used storytelling for everything. So it became obvious that our robot would fit a storytelling activity. We also noticed that children attributed personality to their toys or objects. For example, the bad guy, the shy person, the goofy dog. So we decided to rely on personality attributions to design the social behaviors for the robot. The second stage of the design process is define. And we worked on robot requirements, such as the robot animations, behaviors, and interaction modes. For this, we used the co-design 
with the main goal of collecting requirements from children to develop the social behaviors for the robots. The first part of the co-design study consisted of a body storming session, which is used to verify and in some cases teach the meaning of different personality traits that children would later represent in a robot. In the figure, you can see a girl engaged in body storming where she was enacting a grumpy personality. The second part of the co-design consisted of puppeteering and sketching to develop the social behavior of the robot. We built a paper cube with a built-in drawing mechanism and asked children to act out how this cube would behave according to the personality trait they were creating. This mechanism enabled children to represent the movements of the robot by drawing them in a large sheets of paper. We discovered that children create consistent patterns of movements according to different personality types. For example, children represented a shy robot with a straight pattern moving slowly and a grumpy robot making spiky movements and in a fast speed. The third stage was develop, where we iterated the hardware and software development of the robot by performing intermediate momentary assessments with children. One of these intermediate assessments, which is part of formative research, was the study of the robot's size. To study this, we covered three prototypes of the robot with clay. The reason why the robot was covered with clay was to collect data about where and how children hold the robot, because their fingerprints would stay in the clay. The major outcome of this study was the commitment to a medium-sized robot with a concavity for grasping. The last stage is the liver, where the robot design is finished. At this stage, robots are generally deployed or can be used in experimental studies. We performed a study in school with the latest version of our robots, and our results show that when children played with a full version of the YOLO robot, their stories were more original and therefore more creative. Here you can see the progression of the YOLO robot during the design process, from sketches to different prototypes. So what have we learned from these two years of designing with children? We described seven guidelines for including children in the design process of robots. And for the purposes of this talk, I will mention just a few. You will be able to read more about the other guidelines in the paper. The first guideline is about playfulness. And because it's a central mode of communication for children, it should be at the core of all design activities. The second guideline is that toys and craft materials are used by children daily and therefore should be used as tools for the design process. The third guideline is that child spaces, such as playgrounds or schools, should be the stage in which the design process unfolds. As a summary, I talked about the successful robot design project for which we follow design principles to design the YOLO robots. We use the double diamond process, which guided the design, and we provided guidelines for child robot design extracted from the lessons we learned from this work. Thank you so much for listening. Check out the paper for more details and send me an email if you're interested in this topic.